Good morning, good morning to everybody. Welcome to the kickoff lecture of the Jean Monnet module of uh, digital citizenship for uh, EU. Uh, this is our first lecture of this uh, Jean Monnet module co-financed by the European Commission and taught by me and uh, my colleagues Luca Germano and uh, uh, Cristiana Carletti. Uh, this is our first day of uh, lectures and lessons and for this reason we decided to organize uh, a kickoff lecture with the two very um, well-known uh, guests uh, linked and related to the topic of our uh, Jamone module. Uh, our Jamone module has uh, as main topic, the citizenship. Uh, the citizenship that uh, in this period is, uh, uh, is under a deep reconfiguration, a deep reconfiguration uh, triggered by several reasons. Uh, moreover, uh, this reconfiguration has to be placed in the framework of the European process of integration, uh, which um, uh, which uh, result in a in significant uh, new outcomes uh, uh, from our point of view and uh, this is our goal with this module that is very very multidisciplinary because uh, in this module are involved researchers and uh, professor uh, experienced and skilled in uh, in law in political science and international law uh, the, 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 um, the idea the idea uh, in of this uh, of this module is to investigate citizenship at least through two different drivers uh, the political drivers and the market driver uh, the political driver and the market driver um, why um, because it's clear from our point of view that uh, there is a new way to uh, a new way to perform and to um, decline the political participation of every citizen uh, in consideration of the new um, media, uh, the new internet opportunities, the new online opportunities. And for this reason, uh, we today we will uh, listen the the keynote speech of uh, Luigi Ceccarini, uh, who I thanks. Uh, coming from uh, Uni uh, Urbino Carlo uh, Carlo Bo uh, University, who is the author of a, a, a very uh, a very interesting book about the digital citizenship from a political point of view. But uh, I will give you, Luigi the the floor uh, in a few minutes. From another point of view, we have to consider that. Uh, in the framework of the European process of integration, the citizen is also a citizen of a, a, a market, a single market, a single market which uh, has uh, its own uh, its own values, its own rights, uh, a market which is regulated. Uh, in the regulation uh, of this market, uh, a, 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 a pivotal, a, a, a focal point is played, a focal role is played by the European Commission. And also for this reason, we have the uh, the other guest that I thank you again, uh, uh, which is uh, who is the uh, uh, Antonio Parenti, uh, the European Commission representation in Italy uh, head. Mm. Uh, uh, he, 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 he managed the representation of the European Commission in Italy uh, since a few months, and we are particularly uh, happy to have him uh, uh, talking about the value uh, of. Uh, European citizenship uh, on online uh, on online profiles. Uh, so uh, I would like to not to lose too much time in my very short presentation. And for this reason, I give immediately um, the floor to my colleague Luca Germano for a short introduction uh, on uh, Luigi Ceccarini uh, keynote uh, speech. Luca, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Raffaele. Um, it's a great pleasure for us uh, to host uh, Luigi Ceccarini today and to kick off our course on digital citizenship for EU with his keynote speech. speech. 
and um, probably doesn't need uh, uh, any introduction. But uh, just in case, uh, let me tell, tell you something about him. Uh, Luigi is full professor of politics and head of the School of uh, Political and Social Science at the University of uh, Urbino Carlo Bo. He coordinates the research activities uh, of Laboratory of Political and Social Studies, uh, uh, La Polis, a very well-known laboratory at uh, Italian level, and is co-editor of an important uh, uh, journal of uh, political communication uh, that is called uh, Compol. Um, the main focus of Luigi's research is the relationship between society and politics, new forms of civic and political participation, electoral behavior, generation, political culture, and uh, transformation, of course, of uh, representative uh, democracy. On these topics, uh, uh, Luigi uh, has been publishing uh, widely in prestigious uh, national and international venues. And uh, um, uh, Luigi presents uh, today, of course, is precious uh, since he is an expert of, uh, uh, on the subject of uh, digital citizenship. Um, his latest book, uh, published a few days uh, ago by Edward Elgar, uh, is titled The Digital Citizenship, uh, Politics and Democracy in the Network Society. Uh, here, he explored multiple and contested meaning of uh, citizenship uh, in the 21st century as representative democracy faces uh, mounting crisis uh, in the wake of digital age and tries to answer to the difficult question uh, on the, what does it, does it mean today to be citizens in the globalized world of internet age. Um, I stop here and uh, give the floor to Luigi. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you to my colleague, Professor Torino, and then also uh, Carletti, Luca Germano, that uh, we usually meet uh, around Europe uh, during uh, <laughs> a PSA uh, annual meeting or somewhere else in Italy too. And thanks for this invitation to uh, Claudia Mariotti, which uh, is a very good friend, and she was also a colleague at the University of Urbino uh, some years uh, ago. I'm very uh, happy to be here today, very proud. Uh, and then I want to thank uh, uh, Roma Tre for this invitation, because this is my first presentation. So it is uh, like a, a run trial for this uh, uh, book that is, is um, just uh, published by this international publisher and um, I haven't received yet any copy of the book but I bought one <laughs> in the ebook uh, version and uh, let me say first that this book is not uh, a new one in some sense because shall I, shall I uh, okay can you can you see this slide Yes, of course. Okay, that's good. So as you can see here, you can see the uh, the cover of the of the book just published, the one that uh, uh, Luca Germano just uh, mentioned, the digital citizenship, politics and democracy in the network society. But in 2015, I wrote a book for uh, Il Mulino publisher in Italian, and the title was La Cittadinanza Online. So I revised that book. It's not just a translation, but I updated that uh, uh, book that I published five years ago, and uh, where I tried to adapt the content of the book for an international uh, reader for um, using new data because there are, this is not a research book as you we will see but uh, uh, there are some data in order to frame the 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 um, the problem of the citizenship and the transformation of the citizenship uh, thanks to uh, the digitalization of uh, our society our everyday life so it is not just a translation but it was updated and adapted to uh, this uh, uh, international uh, audience and uh, 
Um, what is, uh, I think, uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, of this book is that there is a mix between uh, classical uh, issues, classical concepts that I tried to uh, contaminate with new literature, with new um, arguments, with uh, new literature. This is another important point because the book I wrote in 2015 uh, seems that uh, I wrote this many, many years ago because in the meanwhile, many other uh, books, many other literature has been uh, uh, published by scholars which are specialist of uh, political communication, digital political communication, digital uh, participation, new forms of participation, and uh, also the one who have um, taught over this concept that actually citizenship is, oh sorry, citizenship is a very uh, old, in some sense, a very classical concept, but is at the same time, um, how can I say, uh, in progress concept, like democracy otherwise. So what is my starting uh, point? My starting point is, uh, as you can see in the subtitle, is democracy. Democracy, representative democracy is now challenged and many things are changing about uh, democracy and many other elements which are connected, linked to democracy, like political culture. Political culture is changing. And if political culture, when political culture, culture is changing, also uh, the way, the way people, citizens participate uh, uh, is changing. Uh, the public sphere, for example, this is another interesting and classical concept I refer to uh, Jürgen Habermas, but <clears throat> um, the, public concept, uh, the public sphere is the place of the public debate. What does it mean today to talk about public sphere in a digitalized uh, war. So there are many, many different phenomena, phenomena that are stressing, to use a fancy word, are stressing uh, democracy and in particular representative democracy. Uh, try to think, for example, to the generational turnover, young people that are new citizens they have a completely different political culture. They have been socialized in a different scenario, political scenario. And then we have now also the pressure made by uh, the technological development. The media ecosystem is changed, completely changed. Now we live in a digital age and uh, what we do every day to get information using our smartphone, for example, or using digital television, or uh, using podcasts, for example, or, or, or watching streaming TV or something like, uh, like that. So there are so many different phenomena that influence the uh, idea and the concept of citizenship. <clears throat> And citizens, I want to stress, of course, in the political dimension of uh, uh, cultural dimension of the of this uh, uh, political issue, uh, citizens now have a different approach towards politics. We live in a post-ideological era, and uh, this um, has to do with the classical, the traditional. Uh, actors of politics, like political parties. So all of these have very strong, very deep repercussions on uh, the way how citizens become part of the community, of their community, the community in which they live, uh, in which they belong to, their own political community their own societies, their own 
um, political uh, uh, realm in way they in the, in, in which they uh, they live. <coughs> so to look out at uh, citizenship means also to study how society is changing. It's like a proxy, I would say. So studying, uh, as uh, as Germano said, I used to study, for example, uh, electoral behavior. But to study electoral behavior means also to study how people is changing, how citizens uh, uh, are, are uh, changing. Of course, technology is very important. Uh, it's very important for our everyday life, for our political participation, but also culture, as I said before, and then socialization is fundamental in this, uh, in this uh, uh, perspective. And it affects also the idea of the common good, how to take uh, responsibility for these uh, um, elements, which has to do with our everyday uh, life. And of course, I want to stress this word, which is not new at all, but is very important for me, as uh, uh, already uh, has highlighted uh, uh, Germano. Of course, I'm very, very interested in a key word that is participation. Participation in a wide sense, I, I would, uh, I would uh, say, because participation means to be part, means uh, to take part. So uh, participation is the way how citizens are part of different polities, because there is the local polity, uh, the town hall, and then the city where you live, and then where you can uh, uh, behave as a citizen, but you, we are uh, also um, part of uh, the national polity, Italia, for example. But like uh, in your um, course, in your, uh, in your uh, uh, module, also Europe, for example, is another important polity. And how citizens behave, how citizens uh, um, uh, look at the uh, European institutions and how they participate to this, it's very important to study in order to have an idea how citizenship the, and then participation uh, is uh, uh, changing. So the frame is completely changed over the last uh, decades. Some scholars talk about uh, the uh, idea of post-representative politics and post-representative democracy. Others, I mean, for example, uh, Simon Tormey, or uh, if we uh, refer to John Keane, he talks about monitoring democracy or uh, other, uh, he's an Australian, but other scholar like uh, uh, Shatson, he talks about the monitorial citizen or the monitoring citizen and uh, other, other political philosopher like uh, Rosanne Ballon, he talks about counter democracy. So there are different scholars around the world that uh, want to stress how our politics is uh, changing. And to embrace the perspective of citizenship, I think it's very important because talking about citizenship in a very wide sense, broad sense, we have to take into consideration how people participate and how is changing participation. I'm fully aware that uh, uh, my work on citizenship is necessarily partial and limited uh, because, uh, um, for example, I don't consider all the studies in low studies for uh, uh, framing uh, citizenship. I, I, I used my literature that I refer to uh, is the political science uh, literature. So for me, participation is a fundamental 
concept uh, uh, to take into consideration and is linked to technology, the transformation of technology. And of course, there is another important uh, discipline that I think we have always to take into consideration that is demography and how generation, new generations are changing uh, the political life and then the political uh, society, culture. So it has also a culturalist approach and of course globalization or much better to say the processes of globalization in the plural way that are changing uh, the role of the citizens in the um, political institutional uh, frame. So the uh, public space is in a constant transformation. I wanted to stress this on my book is a kind of transversal uh, element of, uh, of uh, this, um, this study, this, uh, uh, this work, because the uh, public space is, a, I would define this, a kind of ever-changing world, because the public space is the effect of the citizens who live inside this uh, uh, field, in this uh, realm. Um, and also the main protagonists of this uh, space are uh, changing. Try to think political parties, for example. Political parties are very, very uh, important actors for the mediation and uh, for the representation, which are uh, basic words for uh, democracy. But they have changed completely. We are now talking about uh, digital parties, micro parties, pop up <laughs> parties, where uh, um, the frame is a post ideological frame. These parties are defined as cartel parties, so far away from the society. This means that there is more room, more space for rethinking participation, for rethinking how to be part of the community, a way that is completely different from the traditional uh, phase of uh, the so-called golden age of the party, that I'm not sure if there was really a golden age of the party, but it is something very different uh, from the past. But not just political actors, like uh, political parties or other intermediate uh, bodies like uh, unions or churches or big organizations, social, social political organizations. But uh, I think that we have to take into consideration also citizens, men and women, and in particular their, their identities, because Participation changes according to the identities of the, of the, of the, of the people. And uh, the way how they use resources, political resources, technology, information. We live in a society where there is an abundance of information. Or all the innovations in the field of... Uh, democracy, so democratic innovation is very important in order to, to include, inclusion is another important word for, for, this, uh, for my, uh, my work. And uh, <clears throat> so we have to consider how these resources are used to be present in the, in the public uh, space. So the main question the basic question is, how can citizen be good citizen in, uh, in, uh, in the digital era, in the networked uh, society? I tried to give an answer to this, uh, to this uh, uh, question uh, using, uh, uh, producing actually uh, this uh, book and uh, revisiting this uh, book uh, in the light of 
the new literature and uh, uh, research uh, uh, outcome um, that uh, during the last years have been published by scholars. As you can see, I have, so the articulation of this book is uh, made by seven chapters, of course, the introduction and the uh, seven chapters. And uh, the introduction and the first chapter are free access. So if you, if you like, you can download it by the website of the uh, Elgar Edwards publisher. <clears throat> and uh, what is, uh, I think, important is uh, to stress, what time is it, Just for five minutes on the, on the first one in, in, uh, in the background. The background, why is so important this, in my, in my view, of course, uh, uh, this chapter? Because I try to sketch, I try to outline the scenario using uh, in this uh, first uh, chapter. I try to discuss many different elements that are strictly connected to my uh, central concept, the citizenship, and how it has changed uh, the norms of citizenship, so, and then the way how people participate. I uh, brought uh, 13, if I'm not wrong, uh, paragraph in this, uh, in this uh, uh, first uh, chapter that are then exploded in the following chapters. Uh, uh, so citizenship, identity, and political community, where you can find also basic elements uh, of the traditional literature, uh, mixed with uh, the new perspective and uh, and uh, the new the new um, reflections on on this uh, uh, concept. Secondly, um, citizens how they have changed, the aligned and critical. So I think citizens are not just the aligned, are not just detached, but are also uh, critical. They have the possibility, thanks to, for example, digital resources to, to, can you hear me? Because I, I saw, uh, Yes, a, yes. A phone call from Rome. I, I thought there was a problem in my in my in my presentation. So that's fine. So the second the second chapter uh, the the third chapter is wants to get to give a profile of the nowadays citizen, uh, the aligned but not just the aligned, detached but not just detached. Not just there is not just the disenchantment about politics, but there is also a critical approach uh, that can use digital resources in order to uh, affect politics, influence politics, to say something about politics uh, at local level, but also at global level. And then um, I wanted also to stress on the idea of participation in the fourth uh, chapter in the frame. And uh, as you can see here, there is a reference to Colin Crouch in the frame of the post-democracy that gives us the idea that democracy is changing. Uh, we, in, in the book, I mentioned many scholars that uh, they had a prefix to the democracy. For example, hybrid democracy, Yamanti, or uh, audience democracy, Bernard Manin, counter democracy, Rosan Ballon, monitor democracy, John Keane. So this means that democracy is changing and uh, scholars are thinking about it. And the, the uh, challenges uh, towards democracy has to be taken into consideration in order to understand also many other elements which are strictly connected to democracy, like participation and citizenship. The fifth, the fifth chapter is uh, devoted to the monitorial approach, which is something uh, that has to do with the idea or, of surveillance, uh, but the monitoring approach 
is uh, something that has to do with the role, the active role of the citizen, which is not just a voter. So it just, it's not just uh, a person who go to the, um, to the ballot every four or five years, but can have a continue uh, control, a continue monitoring uh, uh, approach towards uh, politics. And then uh, the, this intermediation, this is another important element. I'm not sure if this intermediation is the right word. Uh, I would uh, prefer to talk about re-intermediation because there are other, other, um, I say, other um, protagonists, other actor of the, the uh, mediation. But this is very uh, important uh, point to, uh, which is strictly connected to the digital with digitalization of the communication and of course also of the politics. So just to another five minutes to describe what you can find in the in this first chapter because it is very important uh, to consider these elements that I tried to uh, to sketch briefly in the, in the paragraphs of uh, this chapter. So rethinking citizenship. We have to consider citizenship something live uh, and then uh, something that is changing over time. When we talk about citizenship, we, of course, refer first of all to uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas uh, um, uh, Marshall, eh? when he over fifties discussed about this uh, uh, concept, uh, it is a classical, a seminal book about this concept. But we have to rethink citizenship, and I enlarge this uh, using literature, of course, um, considering the effective dimension of the citizenship. So that means the identity, the sense of identification. So in this sense. My approach is a culturally culturalist approach, and that is fundamental in order to understand also uh, the relationship between citizens and uh, and uh, politics. And then uh, I tried to, to explore another important element that is the inclusion. Inclusion can be seen uh, as um, a synonymous of democracy in some sense, because democracy is, is based on the idea of mass politics, is based on the idea, and then of course representative democracy, is, is based on uh, the idea of uh, the inclusion of citizens in the political uh, systems. Of course, there are many important um, uh, actors that can facilitate this inclusion. But political parties are changing, have changed a lot. Political parties have changed a lot over the last uh, decades, as I have uh, already uh, mentioned. Uh, there is a question mark, because I don't think that political parties are that in some sense. <laughs> political parties have changed their location, have changed their role. In the past, you remember, for example, Max Weber or Neumann, Sigmund Neumann, they underlined in their definition of the mass political party, the function of social integration or democratic integration. Maybe this function is now more weak than in comparison with the past, but it's very, uh, still, they are still very important in the functioning of the political uh, system, even if they stimulate sentiments of disaffection, sentiments of uh, anti-party sentiments, and uh, but uh, they are still important in the political uh, system. They have changed. They have changed in terms of organization, they have changed in terms of uh, their the importance uh, and in, uh, their role in the uh, society. And another author which is very important for me 
is uh, Bernard Manen. He talked about audience democracy and in the audience democracy, audience democracy, citizens are seen as spectators. Uh, they have a different role in comparison with the previous uh, uh, democracy, the so-called party democracy. So, uh, but things are changing. Also Bernard Manin said that things are changing. Uh, spectators are in some sense uh, passive citizens, but now the digital resources can help citizens to become more active. Of course, in a different way in comparison with the past. They are more uh, individualistic in some sense. Um, they live and they behave in a more fragmented uh, frame, but uh, they have opportunity to be more uh, engaged. Mm. Uh, also uh, with, with uh, less cost because uh, to get informed today is easier than in the past. Of course, there are post there are problems about <laughs> the informative abundance. So what I want to stress in this book is the political dimension that is very important and is strictly linked to the new generations, the native uh, uh, digital generation. Uh, they socialized in a completely different environment, no bipolarization, international bipolarism. Um, they use uh, digital tools, digital resources in a very easy way because, because they, they uh, were born where, when internet was already already uh, there and this affects also um, politics of course and what is important about uh, the connection between technology and democracy is uh, i'm referring here to rodota and the risk that uh, uh, technology makes the politics a kind of referendum democracy because it's easier to click and to vote but if there is just a, democ a referendum democracy without discussion then referring to the public sphere the traditional idea of public sphere there is of course uh, a problem because politics is also a discussion it is also argumentation counter and argumentation is the formation of public opinion and so on um I go on quickly because uh, it is 9.45 and uh, I also discussed uh, the concept of disintermediation and individualization. This is uh, very important because uh, mediation and representation is the basic element of democracy, but the digital transformation put in discussion uh, these uh, elements. Uh, and then this intermediation is something that we have to take into consideration in order to understand how uh, politics and democracy um, works um, today. And individualization is uh, an important process that has to do with uh, the globalized world, the risk society, the change in the political culture, and then in the culture in a, in a broader sense, and many authors have talked about uh, life politics, for example, Giddens or Bennett, lifestyle politics, which means that there is uh, individualization in our age, also in the uh, political um, engagement. This is another point, another important point that I wanted to stress because it's fundamental in order to understand how citizens participate today. So pervasiveness 2.0, uh, just one, one figure. More than 60% of the world population use internet. There are about four or uh, five billions of people that use internet. Can you imagine the impact of this? Not just in the everyday life, but also in the political uh, uh, 
uh, real. Of course, there are different uh, levels of social penetration of the internet, but now uh, the presence of, uh, of the, the web and the use of the web is really widespread all over, all over uh, the, the world. Of course, there are very different ideas about uh, online democracy. There is an approach, an utopia, utopian approach, but there is also its opposite because democracy is not just something for mm, democracy. Uh, it's sometimes uh, the digital communication, the digital tools are used by non-democratic government leaders in order to control uh, the protester, for example. There are very interesting uh, uh, reports from Freedom House. Uh, the last one, uh, Freedom on the Net, 19, <clears throat> uh, 2019, uh, had a, a very emblematic title, The Crisis of Social Media. And the subtitle stresses on the idea even more clearly. What was once a liberating technology has become a tool for surveillance and electoral manipulation. So internet is an ambiguous creature, is an ambiguous element that has to be considered with all its uh, faces. We talked about public sphere, but I think it's much better to talk about public spheres in the plural, because the digital communication changed the, 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 the levels, the, the, the opportunity, the spaces where to discuss, where to uh, build a public opinion, where uh, uh, to form the uh, idea about politics and where to discuss uh, collective, collective uh, uh, issue. Uh, in the in the everyday life of citizens, this makes the uh, um, the scenario much more fragmented. For example, much more liquid. For example, if you want to recall uh, Bauman, and uh, of course uh, uh, the digital can be. The digital opportunities can be used also as a counter power, especially in the age of distrust that uh, affects um, the uh, perspective of citizens in this, uh, in this uh, period. Can be used as a tool to control, to monitor uh, uh, politics and uh, is uh, functioning. Last point that I think is very important is to go ahead the classical uh, distinction between real world on one side and virtual world on the other. I think there is a strong connection, a strong contamination between online and offline. So there is just one world <laughs> where these two uh, realms are strictly connected and uh, where, for example, the online communication can foster uh, offline participation and vice versa. So this is a, another point that I wanted to stress and I try to explode in the uh, chapters, in the following chapters uh, that uh, uh, form the, um, the contents of uh, my book. <clears throat> Thanks very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you for this uh, short, sorry for this, but a very precise illustration of uh, your research and the results that you uh, wrote, wrote in your uh, very uh, recent book. That is, uh, I understand it is quite new, not just a, a simple refrain, uh, of course. I think that uh, your keynote speech was uh, very interesting because um, it's clear that, uh, as I try to say quickly at the beginning, uh, our uh, Jean Monnet module uh, tried to put uh, uh, political uh, research and law research uh, at crossroads. 
we would like to investigate uh, the citizenship uh, through the lens of uh, political, uh, pol uh, to the lens of politics and to the lens of, uh, uh, of law. And for this reason, for this reason, uh, we of course uh, uh, cannot avoid to um, consider that, as I told, um, the citizenship as a new allure uh, in consideration of the uh, European process of integration uh, that uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, creates uh, a new way to be a citizen, uh, a, a citizen also of, as I told at the beginning, uh, of the European single market. Uh, European single market uh, in which the European legislator, co legislator, European Parliament, the Council, um, triggered by the initiative power of the European Commission, uh, are trying to set a new uh, framework uh, really, uh, related uh, concerning uh, all the online experience, political experience, uh, citizens' experience, consumers' experience, uh, and so on. Uh, for this reason, in our uh, module, uh, we have uh, two sections devoted to the uh, European laws and regulation. And uh, I am particularly happy to have uh, with us uh, today uh, Antonio Parenti, who leads uh, the uh, European uh, Commission representation uh, in Italy. Uh, thank you, Antonio Parenti, for this to be with us. And uh, uh, that will explain us uh, how, uh, what, and I think, uh, how the European Commission is operating in this, uh, in this way, in this framework. But before to give the floor to Antonio Parenti, just a short introduction of, of him by uh, my colleagues, Cristiana Carletti, uh, who will teach with me and Luca Giordano in this module. Uh, Cristiana, the floor is yours. The, no. You have to unmute. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Now I hope that you can hear me very well. Good morning to all. Good morning to my colleagues, Professor Torino and Professor Germano, and to our teaching and research assistants, Claudia Mariotti, Claudio Di Maio, and Simone Cotura, and to our technical assistance officers, and for sure, to all the students who are online this morning for this kickoff lecture of the Gian Monnet module on digital citizenship for the European Union. As Professor Torino has anticipated, after Professor Ceccarini, we have the pleasure to have today our second relevant speaker for this kickoff lecture, Mr. Antonio Parenti, highly experienced office official with a 25 career path, mostly at the European institutions and in particular at and for the European Commission. I could only mention some relevant mandates he has charged in the last years, testifying his outstanding knowledge and professional experience about the European framework where the digital citizenship is positioned and could be considered, in our view, a key challenge nowadays for present, current times and for the future. He has, uh, he has been the head of the Trade and Economic Office of the Delegation of the European Commission in Moscow, then Deputy Head of the Unit for Trade Relations with the Far East, uh, Deputy Chief Negotiator for the European Union-Japan Free Trade Agreement, um, EU Chief Negotiator for the UN Global Compact on Migration, one of the, of the main key challenges of the European Union in the field of migratory policies, Minister, Councillor and Head of the, of the Section for the Economic Trade and Development at the Delegation of the European Union at the United Nations in New York, and the last but not least two mandates of Mr. Parenti have been at the European External Action Service. And finally, since last June 2020, the head of the Italian representation of the European Commission here in Rome. This said, again, thank you very much, Mr. Parenti, for having accepted the invitation to join us today. And I will give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Torino and to Roma Petre for uh, this invitation to discuss one of the uh, most uh, exciting and relevant issues these days 
uh, on the agenda of the uh, of the European Union, and I think on the agenda of many of many citizens. And uh, a very warm welcome also on my own side to the, all the students that are um, listening to this uh, to this uh, uh, lecture. Um, let me start by quoting someone who has nothing to do with the digital world and uh, maybe someone who's probably is going to put off some of the students because i'll tell you my age with that which is frank sinatra frank sinatra used the song uh, to sing a very famous song called um, my way and my way to a very large extent is the way the european union is trying to go uh, on the digital uh, on the digital world you, you are very well aware that exists a different type of models around the world on how to regulate the digital uh, format with which is let's say moving from the uh, one side which is the american side of extreme freedom extreme deregulation in the digital world and another one which is possibly what you say the chinese model of, of uh, excessive uh, regulatory oversight of the uh, of the system the Euro european union is trying to find uh, a different format uh, for uh, for this, and it is doing it so at a very uh, important moment because when President von der Leyen took over uh, the uh, presidency of the European Commission in uh, 19, in 2019, she was clearly saying, and then she repeated it uh, at the State of the Union, the first State of the Union in September last year, that we need a common plan for a digital Europe which clearly defined goals for 2030, such as for connectivity, skills, and digital public services. And we need to follow clear principles, the right to privacy and connectivity, freedom of speech, free flow of data, and cybersecurity. Let me now try to uh, define and go through the main pieces of the legislation that the European Commission has drafted in this last year, and which explain how these principles are uh, uh, spelled in, in this legislation. And now all of this is going to be fundamental for achieving the uh, Europe digital decade, which has basically just started. And the first point I'd like to, to talk is data governance. The Commission has proposed, in fact, as you know, new rules on data governance, which will facilitate data crossing, uh, data sharing across the EU and between sector, uh, to create uh, wealth for society, increase control and trust for both citizens and companies reg regarding their data, and offer an alternative European model to data handling practices in major platforms. This regulation will create the basis for a new European way of data governance that is in line with the EU values and principles, such as personal data protection, GDPR, consumer protection, and competition rules. This proposal includes a number of measures to increase trust in data sharing, as the lack of trust is currently a major obstacle and result in high costs. Measure to facilitate the reuse of health, um, uh, the reuse of certain data held by public sector. For example, the reuse of health data could advance the research and find cures for rare and chronic uh, uh, diseases means to give European control on the use of the data they generate by making it easier and safer for companies and individuals to voluntarily make their data available to the wider common good under clear conditions. As part of the European digital strategy, the European Commission then proposed two legislative initiatives, the Digital Service Act, DSMA, DSA, and the Digital Market Act, or DMA. The DSA and DMA have two main goals. One is to create a safer digital space in which the fundamental right of all users of digital services are protected and to establish a living playing field to foster innovation, growth and competitiveness both in the European single market and global. Let me take these two acts uh, one uh, by one. The Digital Service Act, or this, uh, DSA, defines the responsibilities of all digital actors operating in Europe. It would improve content moderation on social media platforms to address online violence uh, concern and risks. The DSA proposal 
maintains the current rule according to which companies that post other data are not liable for the content unless they actually know it is illegal. The DSA will introduce new obligation on platform to disclose to the regulators how the algorithm are working, how decision to remove content are taken, and on the way advertisers target users. Many of these provisions are only applied to platforms that have more than 45 million users in the European Union. So it will not apply to each and every uh, platform. But platforms including uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok would meet this threshold and will be subject to the new obligations. And what is important, because of course, any regulation that doesn't have penalties normally has no teeth, companies that do not comply with a new obligation will risk fines, which will be up to 6% of the annual uh, turnover. Now, let me move now to the Digital Market Act. The Digital Market Act is addressed specifically to the major companies, the big tech companies. In fact, it proposes that to classify certain platforms, for example, those with more than 45 million users, again, in, in Europe, including Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, as gatekeepers, and makes them subject to new obligation, which prevent large companies to abuse their market power and to allow smaller and new players to enter the market. As you know, this is fundamental principle of European Union legislation to allow new players in the market and avoid the big players seclude and segment the markets. So the key objective or one of the key objectives is to put an end to a practice called self-preferencing by companies like, for example, Google, uh, which can display their products more prominently among the results of the Google search. Gatekeeper companies uh, will also be prohibited to use people's personal data in other products. For example, Facebook could be restricted in using data obtained by the subsidiaries WhatsApp. Companies that do not comply again with the new obligation would risk fines up to 10% of their worldwide turnover. So not only the one uh, applied in uh, happening in Europe, but worldwide. So the COVID-19, and I'm going towards my, my hand here, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has shown as the protection of fundamental rights, and in particular, the right to privacy and personal data, is part uh, of uh, uh, an effective policy responses in time of crisis, a precondition for ensured and trust and uptake of technological uh, uh, solutions. And we could talk about this uh, when it translates to vaccines for possibly another three or four seminars. The GDPR provides indeed for a flexible legal framework for data protection, which is fit for the purpose, provided the conditions and appropriate safeguards are in place and business, including SME, uh, now have the data, the set of data which can uh, facilitate the business and which uh, are very clear to uh, to the citizen. A citizen can also be made more aware or are going to be made more aware of their of their rights. So we are at uh, if, you want, if you want, at a forefront of a change in the European uh, uh, model of handling data and making sure that the digital world uh, is not set aside of any regulation or works and, uh, and operates in a complete, um, uh, in a complete different uh, environment, but it, 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 it adheres to the principles of uh, the European Union, the Charter of European Fundamental Rights, but above all that it works for uh, this business, the European business and European citizens. These were the goals that uh, had directed the legislator to make these proposals and these are the goals that we would like to uphold in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parenti. Uh, I think that you perfectly highlighted uh, the main points that we will touch in our course, in our Jamone module, uh, with respect to the future regulation of online services, online liabilities. And uh, I think that uh, your speech, uh, together with uh, Luigi Ceccarini's speech, perfectly demonstrate the usefulness, I think, we think, of our uh, multidisciplinary uh, course 
that uh, has as main goal to link uh, politics and law uh, with respect to the future development of uh, um, online uh, participation and online citizenship. Thank you uh, indeed uh, for this. Uh, now, uh, our uh, first hour uh, of uh, lecture and uh, first lesson of the course uh, has ended. Uh, this is a communication for the students. Uh, we, we, uh, now we will uh, see again uh, in uh, 15 minutes uh, on our uh, academic uh, University of Roma Tre platform and teams. I uh, again would like to thank you, uh, Antonio Parente and Luigi Ceccarini, for, your, for their speeches. And uh, I give just a few seconds to Luca Germano and Cristiana Carletti uh, just to see if they would add something uh, uh, to, our, uh, to our speakers, for our speakers. Luca, Cristiana. I go first, <laughs> ladies first. So thank you very much for both the contributions that have been relevant and that have covered, in my view, both concepts, uh, conceptual um, overview uh, of the issue that we are going to 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 deepen during the uh, module, the Germany module, and at the same time something that is more practical, as Mr. Parenti has said, that um, can, could link us uh, for for a very again practical view about the EU legislation and policy so I think that both both the uh, relevant speakers have contributed very well to our kickoff lecture thank you very much to to all thank you thank you uh, just just a couple of words uh, to to thanks the um, both contributions and uh, very very interesting very rich and uh, very uh, important for us for our for our mob module just this thank you very much so uh, at this point we can say goodbye to the next time we are writing uh, among us uh, that all us we hope to see each other live, not online. Uh, and uh, we, <laughs> think that, we think that we will, we will overcome this bad situation in uh, next future. Thank you and say again, bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you.